So how Chinese used to sound, the challenges of an opaque writing system in the study of historical phonology. And uh, just to give you an overview of the talk, first I will uh, make a very brief uh, methodological orientation. Then I will touch on Sumerian uh, as a sort of comparandum, uh, then look at Chinese. And uh, when it comes to Chinese, discuss the nature of the script, phonetic information contained within the structure of the script, uh, phonetic information from uh, external sources, uh, and that will be it. So uh, turning to the method, uh, there's this sort of theory of uh, social science methodology from uh, Karl Marx uh, to ascend from the abstract to the concrete. And I think that's, that's kind of the, the organizational principle I'm uh, going to be using here tonight. The role uh, of Sumerian is to provide me with some of the necessary abstractions and then apply these to Chinese. So I should emphasize that I really know nothing at all about Sumerian, zero, which I see as an, an, a decided advantage. So uh, yeah, so Sumerian uh, begins it's the 31st century BCE, very long time ago. Uh, but the, the older the texts are, the more morphemes are omitted in the writing. Uh, and uh, Sumerian has, let's say, is typologically exciting. Yeah, it has lots of uh, prefixes and suffixes and agreement and all sorts of exciting stuff going on of the type that, um, that we have in a lot of Sino-Tibetan languages, like Kiranti languages and Galronic languages, uh, but generally the kind of stuff we don't think of Chinese as having. Uh, but it's only uh, in the early second millennium when Sumerian was uh, probably already extinct and only spoken in schools that all of the affixes are fully expressed, which is to say, if you look at the, the early Sumerian, when Sumerian was a robust living language, from the point of view of uh, an investigator today, it might well look like a highly isolating language with very little morphology. Uh, and that's just because the Sumerians didn't feel the need to write it down because they all knew it. Whereas uh, in particular in this bilingual context of, of um, Akkadians having to learn Sumerian as a second language, uh, it was, they felt the need to spell everything out. So I think that's a useful uh, story to keep in mind, which means that uh, apparently isolating uh, graphic information uh, does not necessarily say anything about uh, what the morphological profile of the language was. So let's look at some Sumerian concretely. This is the sign for the word sag, which means head. Uh, and then later it was written like this. So you can see that it goes from more iconic to more abstract, partly just for reasons of the convenience of writing. Uh, and then here is the sign for mouth. So you see it's a, it's like the sign for head, but with some indication that you should pay attention to this particular part. And, and then that also gets uh, stylized in a way that has a certain graphic relationship to the stylized version of head. But no phonetic uh, relationship, right? Okay. so. Now uh, you can make uh, phonosemantic compound graphs where you have uh, some indication of the sound and some indication of the meaning. So here uh, I'm giving the example uh, that you see at the bottom of the slide of ma, which means tongue. So uh, this uh, sign is formed by putting me, which means 100, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, tongue semantically, but has a certain uh, phonetic similarity. You put that inside the sign for mouth, and, um, and that's how you form the sign ma, which means tongue. Okay, uh, now just another example of these uh, phonosemantic compound graphs. So we start again with ka, but this time we put uh, noon inside of it. We then get a uh, lip, uh, nundum. Uh, we get the sign for lip. So, so lip has something semantically to do with uh, mouth and something 
phonetically to do with nun. Uh, so it's so that's how we make this uh, sign nundum. Yeah. So now look, let's look at how you actually write uh, a, a, a word. I'm going to look at raven and fish. So you, you, you find yourself wanting to write the word for raven, which was pronounced uga. And I guess, I mean, <laughs> this seems a little bit uh, far-fetched to me, but it's, it's what the secondary literature says. So, uh, so there you go. You say, well, what's the most similar sounding sign I already know of? And apparently it's naga, uh, uh, but uh, clearly naga and uga don't really sound that uh, similar. So I look for a sign u, and I look for a sign ga, and I put the u in front of naga and the ga afterwards, and then I get this structure of, of, I guess the way to understand it is this sign naga that you know, but you also know has the reading uga. Well, in this context, read it uga because I put an u in front of it and a ga after it. So it's quite um, uh, redundant in terms of information, yeah? You could just use the u, and you could just use the ga, and then say uga, like a syllabary. But it's it's more redundant than that uh, for historical reasons. Uh, and I, I should say, of course, there's a lot of spe spelling variation. This is just one way of writing words that are pronounced uga. Uh, and then if you want to distinguish raven from fish, uh, you can put this sign uh, mushen, which means bird, at the end of this uga, or you can put the uh, the kud, which means fish, at the end of the uga. And uh, I think a a anyone who knows Japanese will also recognize that uh, the purpose of uh, these uh, semantic determiners, uh, that's what we would call them uh, in, in Chinese, uh, is not simply to give an indication of the meaning, but also of morpheme boundaries. So that as you're reading, uh, rather than just seeing a string of meaningless syllables, uh, you see, okay, I should bunch these signs together and try and read them as a morpheme. I should bunch these signs together and try and read them as a morpheme. Let's now develop uh, some abstractions about uh, how Sumerian works. So a particular grapheme is associated uh, with at least, because it can, it usually often will be more than one, but at least one semantic value and one phonetic value. So uh, using a notation uh, that William Boltz puts forward, that's quite straightforward, you can think of the sign as kind of plus S and plus P. So if you ignore the semantics of a particular grapheme, we'll call it G1, it can be added to another grapheme, we'll call it G2, to disambiguate the pronunciation of the latter. So we're so we're so we have a sign with both uh, with let's say with more than one, but at least one, P and S, and we're adding another sign to it that we're ignoring the semantics of in order to disambiguate the second sign. So the sign that's being added, we've sort of turned off the S, but we're leaving the P. Okay. Uh, and uh, this we can call the rebus principle. And then on the other hand, if we ignore the phonetics of uh, grapheme G1, we can add it to a grapheme G2 to disambiguate the meaning. So that's what we've seen in the, in the raven versus fish example. And here we can say we've sort of turned off the P and we've left the, the S. And we call this second one semantic extension. Now I call it semantic extension because, because the, the meaning is always a change of meaning. You might be using the first uh, process, the Rebus principle, from going from one pronunciation to exactly the same pronunciation in a different morpheme. But the, the semantic determiners always will be associated with a change in meaning because two different morphemes in a language mean two different things by definition. So that's a semantic extension. So I think that's you know, a nice abstract characterization of what's going on in Sumerian. So now just some, some observations about uh, Sumerian. The development of the writing system took a very long time. Complex graphemes are not 
spatially equivalent to simplex graphemes. Now, this may seem like a strange observation to someone who works in, in, in cuneiform studies, but it's important. It, it's, it's one of the most striking things as a sinologist. And I'll even back up and just look at it. You know, uh, uh, this, this uga, meaning fish, is a different size than just one sign. Whereas in Chinese, we, when we make compound signs, we make everything small so that, so that uh, the size of a sign stays always the same size. Yeah? Another way of putting the same observation is that there's no notion of a character in the Chinese sense. Another thing that I, I think is intriguing is that there's no strict standard of phonetic similarity underpinning the application of the rebus principle. If we just look at uh, the cases that uh, I've discussed, you have me serving as the phonetic for ene, where, where if you want to have an abstract principle, it'd be something like uh, the application of this phonetic in a new environment means that the the new the second the second morpheme ends with the same uh, CV as the one we're using to indicate it, uh, and then there's this nun used for nundum, uh, which instead the principle would be starts with the same CVC, and then using naga for uga I find a little particularly strange because uh, it. It's some kind of principle like ends with the same CV and has some vowel before that CV, but not necessarily the same vowel. It looks to me like the Sumerians did not have a, a phonological theory underpinning their application of the rebus principle. Not that you would expect them to. Uh, and uh, this lack of consistency in principles is made up for with redundancy. Because, you know, if, if I found myself thinking, how does this possibly work in practice? And then I think, well, it's because there's a lot of inbuilt redundancy. You say, you know, uga ga, then you've, you, you've made sure that uh, although there are many dimensions of possible confusion on the part of the reader with the correct training, in a given circumstance, they will always know how to read it. The other thing I've asked myself is how on earth did people, you know, after the death of this language, thousands of years later, figure out any of this? And I, I don't know, but, but I assume it's because we have basically the whole school curriculum of kind of classical Sumerian learning preserved so that, you know, in a sense, well, if, if kids could do it, uh, you know, uh, 3,000 years ago, then scholars can do it today, despite the fact that there are so few kind of rigorous principles underlying the script's organization. So Chinese emerges into history with a fully developed writing system in 1250 BCE, so way, way after Sumerian. And complex graphs are spatially equivalent to simplex graphs. So now we're going to apply our abstractions to the analysis of Chinese. You start with an iconic uh, grapheme. In this case, uh, uh, it looks like a field. It's how you, you know, they, how you lay out a field. So it's a picture of a field, and it means field, and it's pronounced ling. And then you can apply semantic extension to it. This is to the same character, right? Uh, reading it rui later with a different writing. The meaning is um, is like a burr. It's like this kind of raised piece of earth between two fields. Uh, and you can also uh, use the rebus principle. So say, okay, I'm going to use it for another word pronounced ling, here, hunt. It's also later written with a different uh, character. Okay, now just to go through uh, two more examples, uh, you can draw a picture of fire to mean fire. Uh, then you can use that uh, same character, semantically extend it uh, to, to refer to this word conflagration that has a different pronunciation. Uh, you can also take a picture of a, a nose uh, that's pronounced bits. And using the rebus principle, you can use it for this word sbits, uh, which means self. But now let's look at the phonetic information inside the script. So there are these things we call a Sheshang series, which are different characters that are built using the same 
phonetic determiner. And we're going to look at uh, this one, bie, uh, where the pronunciations are coming now from Middle Chinese. So they're attested pronunciations from many centuries later. Yeah. And you see, OK, uh, you have bie, uh, bie in a different tone. The capital X refers to a tone. And then you have pie and you have pie. So looking at evidence like this, uh, you can come up with what we call the Sheshang hypothesis. So uh, Li Feng Kui is not the first version of the Sheshang hypothesis, but we'll say it's the, the one that uh, is most uh, used nowadays, uh, proposes that characters with the same phonetic component share the same rhyme and uh, have a initial that is homoorganic with each other. So we saw this with the examples that I, I gave. They have the same rhyme, uh, but you can al allow interchange between a B, a P, and an aspirated P. So this um, uh, hypothesis is the cornerstone of, of, of all progress, I, I would dare say, in uh, Chinese historical phonology. And uh, let's say one way of summing up my observations on, on Sumerian, or at least some of them, is there is nothing like the Sheshang hypothesis, it seems, in the study of Sumerian. So here's uh, some examples. We see that we have two characters that have the same rhyme, have the same uh, phonetic, but one begins with a nga and one begins with a ha. So we want to sort of fix it, you know, make it so that in old Chinese, this is, these are middle Chinese readings, in old Chinese, uh, they would have had homo organic initials. So the proposal that I think most people believe is that you had a voiceless resonance. So in this case, your voice. Uh, your voiceless velar nasal changes to a, uh, a, a voiceless velar fricative. Uh, and then in a similar case, just to show you that it you know, works uh, in other cases too, uh, we do the same thing for a labial. So we have this, we have characters that have the same rhyme or characters which in middle Chinese readings have the same rhyme, uh, but in their middle Chinese readings, uh, one starts with an N and one again starts with a voiceless velar fricative. So uh, we propose, oh, maybe there were uh, voiceless uh, labial resonance. Uh, and they those change, you know, maybe with some conditioning environment that I'm not going to get into here, into um, uh, voiceless velar fricatives. Okay, so now you see an example of the Sheshang principle in action, how we how we use this, this assumption although well-founded assumption, to, uh, let's say, internally reconstruct Middle Chinese to fit the Sheshang hypothesis. So there's a guy, uh, Xu Shan, who in uh, the very early uh, Han Dynasty wrote a book called The Shouwen Jiezi, where he says, among other things, he, he says of about 9,000 Chinese characters, what the phonetics are and what the semantics are. But he actually had, he classified um, Chinese characters into six types, and only one of them is this phonosemantic compound type. Uh, but um, uh, we will not worry about most of the types. Uh, what we do want to look at is the hui yi type. So this, according to him, is when you take two characters and you combine them without reference to their sound at all, but only from their meaning. And uh, uh, here are some examples. And uh, I, one reason I've, I've decided to talk about this is these examples are like oftentimes when, when someone is first told about the Chinese script, these are examples that they're presented with. So, you know, woman plus child equals good. And woman plus roof equals peace because, you know, having your wife at home, it makes you feel so peaceful. Yeah. And uh, the sun and the moon together are bright because you know the sun's bright and the moons are bright. So somehow uh, the sun and the moon together are bright. So these are kind of just so stories uh, that suggest uh, you know the Chinese uh, wrote ideas and then they uh, combined their ideas to create new ideas, writing the ideas directly with graphemes rather than via the mediation of language. So you can probably guess that I have a certain uh, skepticism about this. Let's look at Sumerian. Uh, does, the, does, does Sumerian have 
Kuei Yi uh, characters. I don't know what the Sumerians say. They probably don't call them Kuei Yi characters in any case. Uh, but here is one example I have seen discussed in the secondary literature, which is uh, Sag plus Ninda, so head plus bread uh, can be read Gu, which means eat. And I just want to point out that it is not necessary to look at this picture and analyze it as Sog plus Ninda. You can just say it's a person putting bread in their mouth. It's a, it's a, it's, it, the iconic uh, relationship is still there. And it's a, it becomes a philological question. You know, maybe this character is attested before Ninda as bread. Maybe Ninda as a grapheme was actually extracted from this character, right? There's, there's nothing a priori uh, that tells you that, you know, the relationship between iconic things, if the iconicity is still active. In any case, moving on to Chinese, I would say the same thing about this example of woman plus child equals good. In oracle bone inscriptions, the character exists and it's still iconic. Let's say it's a child sitting on a woman's uh, lap. And that's not an uncontroversial interpretation, but it's iconic. That's the point I'm making. It's not necessary because it's iconic already to see it as a combination of the words woman and child. Uh, William Boltz, who is who I'm following for most of this, uh, believes there are no Huayi characters and that the reason uh, that uh, that Chu Shen thought there were was because of changes, both sound changes and meaning changes and uh, and, and paleographic changes uh, between the origin of the script and the uh, early Han Dynasty. So let's look at some of these uh, Hui Yi characters. Okay, peace. Peace is a, a woman under a roof. Well, not necessarily, because in fact there are two Sheshong series that use uh, this uh, phonetic, one with na-like readings and one with on-like readings. So it's perfectly fine to say just that the semantic in peace is roof and the phonetic is woman. To give uh, uh, another example, we have this picture of the moon. So it, it means moon, yeah. And there's one series built on it in the meaning moon where it's read nuat, uh, and you can see the series there. And there's one series built on it uh, in the meaning night where it was pronounced something like zgak. Uh, so that part everyone agrees with. But now let's move to a third one. Boltz would say there's a third reading of this character in the meaning like bright, uh, where there's a series that bright itself is built from, and that uh, the character for name is built from. So bright would have been pronounced marang, and if you look at it, uh, it's not the sun that the moon is next to. It's the word for window. In Baxter and Cigar's reconstruction, the word for window uh, was pronounced something like kamrang. So you can actually see it exactly like in the Sumerian case uh, that we, uh, where you know this picture moon had three readings. So we're, we're applying uh, either uh, further phonetic specifiers or further semantic specifiers to say which of those three readings are intended. Uh, okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the Hui Yi uh, hypothesis. But basically, the, the, the lesson I want you to go away with is if anyone ever says, oh, you know, in Chinese, uh, child plus woman is, is good and uh, woman plus roof is, um, is peaceful, that's nonsense. Uh, woman plus child is good is is not uh, Shu Shen's example. That I was that was a little bit of sleight of hand. Uh, Shu Shen only I th I think he gives something like only seven Hui Yi, and I I thought about presenting those, but they were less sort of um, obvious, uh, so I didn't. Which is to say, the the, the stupid Hui Yi examples should not be credited to Shu Shen. <laughs> uh, they've they've come up you know uh, later. So now just a, 
a few words about uh, phonetic uh, sources, ex external phonetic sources. We have loans from Chinese and other languages and loans into Chinese, and then uh, some explicit comments, philological comments about pronunciation. So loans from Chinese into other languages. Uh, Chinese has uh, uh, this word for 10,000, uh, which in Middle Chinese is something like man. Uh, and Baxter and Cigar actually in 2014 reconstructed for reasons that I'm not going to go into with an unspecified consonant prefix. But if you look at Old Turkic and Tocharian, which are words that you know were in contact with Chinese at the right time, uh, they both uh, point to a T prefix. And this uh, T prefix also helps explain the occurrence of this word scorpion that has a T initial in Middle Chinese in the same Sheshang series. So here's an example where uh, you know, Baxter and Cigar didn't know, was it a T prefix or a P prefix or a K prefix? And then the borrowing of this Chinese word into other languages shows us it must have been a T prefix. Moving on, Indo-Aryan loans into Old Chinese. Uh, so uh, I think that the word for horse uh, in Old Chinese was something like rma, and that it comes from arwant uh, in Indo-Aryan. And uh, this is based on uh, work that's still unpublished with Hannes Fellner and Dieter Gunkel. Uh, maybe a, a, a less controversial example is the word uh, chariot, which is borrowed from uh, the Indo-Aryan word for wheel. And archaeological evidence, I think, is totally unambiguous uh, that Indo-Aryan speakers introduced the horse and chariot to China around 1250 BC, which incidentally is also when the Chinese invented their writing system. Although that's, you know, that's a surely a coincidence, right? Okay, now explicit comments on pronunciation. So I don't want to go into this in too much detail, but you have comments like this one, where in the seventh century, someone says how to pronounce transliterations from uh, Sanskrit into Chinese. He says that, uh, those characters used to transliterate short vowels in Sanskrit should all be read in the rising tone. So this is something that Mei Tzu Lin uh, points to as evidence that there was a glottal stop final in the rising tone, which would correlate with uh, short vowels. Uh, and then here's a, a discussion from the Shouenjie about dialect differences. So they say, okay, there's this word uh, brush, and in Chu it's called murut, and in Wu, it's called Prut, and in Yan, it's called Put, and in Qin, it's called Prut. Uh, so this is, you know, good evidence for figuring out how Old Chinese was pronounced. Uh, uh, explicit discussion of dialect variation. And here's another example where I, I will sort of skip over the details, but basically a guy uh, travels to a certain area and, um, and they pronounce uh, uh, a word uh, that he pronounces as lip, they pronounce it like pick. Uh, so this is maybe good evidence for a constant cluster, something like prick in Old Chinese. Uh, and then uh, last but not least in these kind of explicit philological uh, discussions, uh, one of the best, I think, examples of dialect uh, variation in Old Chinese uh, discussed by Baxter and Cigar is that, that R changes to N in the West and R changes to Y in the East. And here's an example. Nowadays, the people of Yanzhou all pronounce the family name Yin as Yi. So they pronounce, you know, Ur as Ai. And transcriptions of loan words, I'm not going to go through this uh, in detail, but I'll just point out these are, these are uh, Middle Chinese, Han Chinese, Sanskrit. And you see that uh, you get in Middle Chinese capital H's uh, where you have uh, an S in Sanskrit. And that's quite good evidence, I think, that these were actually pronounced as S's at, at, at this point. Yeah. And then, I don't know, just a fun uh, case, Alexandria. So if you say this in, you know, even in Middle Chinese, you get uyik srenle. It's not a great transcription of Alexandria. Uh, but in old Chinese, it's alek sran rai. Okay, there are still some details that are confusing to me, like what, where did the D go? But, uh, you know, I think it's pretty good evidence that, for instance, this ya comes from la and was still la in 36 BC. Okay, and then the very last thing I will talk about 
is rhyme patterns, where if you look at old poetry, and this is a, an ode, and you read it in modern Chinese, you can tell it should rhyme because you get things like duo and luo rhyming in the second stanza. And you get things like jie and xie rhyming in the third stanza. But in the first stanza, it sure doesn't seem like cai and yo rhyme. So um, these are these kinds of uh, things are invitations to make proposals that fix the rhyme scheme. And I'm going to just give one example, although it's not from that uh, uh, poem, which is there's this idea that the vowel a ah, as opposed to a ah, in uh, Middle Chinese comes from ra in Old Chinese. And if you look at some rhymes, you get uh, mak, huak, and uh, hyak rhyming. So if you change the hyak into, uh, into you know, sorry, the krak, hyak into krak, to krak, <laughs> rather, it would rhyme better. And then similarly, in another ode, you get kang, huang, uh, kuang, xiang. So if this kuang changed into kuang or kruang, then it would rhyme better. So that's just an example of the, the you know one of the motivations we have either for, for coming up with hypotheses or for testing hypotheses about uh, how old Chinese was uh, pronounced. Even though uh, Chinese really doesn't give you much information about how it was pronounced, the methods are the same as you would use in figuring out how Latin was pronounced or how Greek was pronounced, which is you look at loan words in and out of the language, you look at the, the inherent structure of the script, uh, you look at philological comments like explicit you know meta discursive things you look at uh, po uh poetic devices that give you information about phonetics the tone we mark with capital h in baxter's uh transcription of middle chinese comes from an s and i can point to evidence like sanskrit for that and then the uh, tone that uh, Baxter marks with an X, um, it comes from a glottal stop. I think the evidence for that is much less convincing. Actually, the um, the the fact that uh, you know th this one comment that I pointed to of of uh, use this tone when when trans or when pronouncing transcriptions of Sanskrit short vowels uh, is one of the considered one of the best pieces of evidence. Uh, but otherwise, it's uh, dialect pronunciations, particularly in southern China, where it's still articulated with a final glottal stop. One thing to, to mention is that Middle Chinese has four tones. So I just told you about two of them. One of them we don't need to talk about because you can think of it as the, the unmarked tone. And then the fourth one is, uh, is stop finals. So in, in, let's say, in Chinese internal analysis, a syllable like pang and a syllable like pak are the same, but in different tones. So in, in the West, we would you know, tend to say, no, they're not the same. One ends with a nasal and one ends with a stop. But um, al already you know, in, let's say, uh, 602, when we get an explicit analysis of these things, uh, the Chinese uh, phonological tradition treated those as the same modulo differences of tone. And at that time, there were four tones. There are Chinese dialects with way more than four tones. Those are secondary splits because of things like uh, manner onset. Uh, this gets into sort of our articulatory phonetics that it's not really my area. But uh, for instance, um, uh, like if you look at the first formant of a syllable pronounced with a, a voiced onset, and the same syllable pronounced with a voiceless onset, uh, the formant of the syllable pronounced with the voice onset will be lower. That's just a sort of fact of human biology, right? So bak is going to have a lower first formant than pak. So the theory is, and this of course is, I'm giving a general presentation, not actually what happened in, in old Chinese to middle Chinese, uh, is that um, speakers re-phonologize the contrast from one of manner onset to one of pitch. Uh, so then let's say in, in old Chinese, uh, something similar, which is that um, uh, glottal stops tend to correlate with a, a decline in pitch and S's tend to correlate with uh, a rise in pitch. And what makes people do that? Well, I don't know. The probability space 
is constrained by uh, human biology and human reason, if you like. Uh, but when and where these changes actually take place is, is, I don't know, is just what history is. I reassure you that it is real. So uh, let's take it this way. Uh, we start in 602. That's when we had Middle Chinese. Uh, and let's say as, a, as, a, as, an, as an abstraction, as a kind of point of analysis, we can pretend that at that moment, although this is of course not true, there was no dialect variation. And then woo, you get dialect variation spreading out. Um, by the Tang Dynasty, you had this Northwest Middle Chinese which has some very clear features associated with it. Like final T has changed into final R and nasal initials have become pre-nasalized stops. So uh, just to give one example, a syllable like not would have changed into ndar, yeah? Um, and you can tell that like, you know, th there's loads of evidence, uh, transcriptions into uh, in and out of Tibetan, in and out of Uyghur, just there's loads of evidence. Uh, I think in and out of Tonga. Uh, and it's also clear that at a certain point, that dialect stopped being spoken, got sort of engulfed in uh, the mass of other Chinese dialects around it. Uh, Zhongwei Shen uh, has written about this in his new uh, book uh, from Cambridge University Press. And there are some features of uh, Old Northwest that, that have been sort of let's say, I don't quite like this way of talking, but that surface as a substrate influence on the varieties of standard Mandarin spoken in Northwest China, but old Northwest uh, Chinese has sadly disappeared. Well, I'll just talk about one example. It's three women. In that case, Boltz says, uh, let's say that at a minimum, one of those women is the phonetic and one of them is uh, a semantic, yeah? And I think that, um, let's say, and some people have said that's absurd, right? People look at it and they see three women. Uh, but then I would say, uh, you know, it, 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 there's two questions that need to be sort of taken separately. One is, our attempt to model the psychology of pre-modern people. And the other one is the correct methodology for doing our own research. And uh, I think it's a reasonable hypothesis to suggest that uh, at the margin, people preferred to have writings that were not uh, wildly uneconomical in terms of their, their sort of phonological analysis, which is to say, you know, look, if if you can analyze woman as a phonetic radical in that situation, why not? Now, then if you push that sort of methodology too far, then you come up with sort of absurd questions like, well, which woman is the phonetic and which one is the semantic, right? Which, which clearly, at that point, you need to sort of take the perspective of the of the the internal psychology of the pre-modern people and say like, well, that kind of question wouldn't arise.